Good afternoon, everyone. And good afternoon, Jamie, Ashley, and John. And thank you so much for joining us today. I am Camille Hoisington, and I'm head of strategic projects at Travis Connect. And it's my pleasure to kick off today's webinar, Intellectual Property 101, How to Protect and Monetize Your Creative Work. So just so you all know, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Travis Connect YouTube page within 24 hours. So you can watch it again and share it with your network. And our speakers today will present for the first 45 minutes or so, and then there'll be time at the end for Q&A. So to submit a question, you can use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, and your questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'd like to very briefly introduce our speakers today, and then I'll hand it over to Jamie. Um, with us today, we have John DiGiacomo. He's a partner at Revision Legal. We have Jamie Kemmler. He's VP of Intellectual Property and Business Strategy at Stryker, and then Ashley Sloat is President and Director of Patent Strategy at Aurora Consulting. And you can read their full bios um, via our event page. But for now, um, thank you all for joining us. And Jamie, over to you. Uh, thanks, Camille. And let me uh, go ahead and share the screen. OK, can everyone see that? I think um, everyone's muted, but hopefully you can see that. So again, thanks to uh, to Camille and to Creative Coast for sponsoring this. Um, we uh, we look forward to an interesting conversation. So really, what our purpose here is to give a very high level um, perspective on how to protect intellectual property, which is really the output of your creative work, and then opportunities for how to monetize, how to make money from that. And we've got a, a great group of speakers, and I'm pleased to, uh, to give a quick background on each of them. So Ashley Sloat, as you heard, is um, head of Aurora Consulting, and her focus is um, patents, and she's a USPTO registered patent practitioner, and her clients include a lot of startup ventures and emerging growth companies. Her uh, educational training is a PhD in the life sciences, specifically in biomedical sciences, and she's also had experience in tech transfer at the University of Michigan, which is a, a place where the um, IP of the faculty is commercialized. She's got experience on how to do that. Um, we also have uh, John Giacomo, as uh, mentioned. It runs Revision Legal, which is here in Traverse City. And I wanted to mention all three of us are based in the Traverse City area. Um, and his firm is uh, focused in a, a variety of areas, including intellectual property, corporate law, and internet law. He's also an adjunct professor at Michigan State University College of Law. And in 2020, the um, publication Best Lawyers, uh, which is um, highly uh, sought after by attorneys, named him as one of the best lawyers in the Midwest in the field of intellectual property. So uh, great background there. Um, uh, I'm uh, Jamie Kemmler with Stryker, as mentioned. I've been in the med tech field my whole career. Um, in the last eight years, I've gotten much more focused on um, IP business strategy, which has been taking non-core intellectual property from the company and licensing it out to, in, in most cases, to uh, startup companies. So in our talk today, Ashley's going to cover patent and trade secret protection, which is an important part of IP. Um, John will cover trademark and copyright protection, and I'll go through the monetization and licensing. So at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing and ask Ashley to begin her part. Thank you, Jamie. Let me get the right screen up here. All right, and hopefully everybody can see my screen. So thanks everybody. As Jamie mentioned, I'll be doing um, a primer on both trade secret law and patent law. So what is a trade secret? So it is really any confidential business information which provides an, a, a competitive advantage to your business. And so this can come in many, many different forms. It can come in the form of sales methods, distribution methods, consumer profiles, manufacturing processes. For example, maybe you have a really unique way of making a catheter more flexible, but it's really hard for the, uh, a competitor, competitor to discern what you've actually done during the manufacturing process. It could be suppliers, list of suppliers and clients. It could be software implementations, especially if it's very hard to reverse engineer that software. So maybe some unique ML AI 
uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence kind of processes. And so lots of different things can be trade secreted. And to kind of bring everybody together, as you probably all know, some of the best kept um, trade secrets are the Coca-Cola recipe and the KSC recipe. And of course, there's many, many other examples. Um, they're probably all around us, you know, each and every day. Um, I know we have a lot of people who work in software and manufacturing that have certain processes that they keep secret. And so how does trade secret protection actually work? So the interesting thing about trade secret protection is it is only protected from somebody who shouldn't have the information, right? If they obtain the information from unauthorized means, through misappropriation, through stealing, through anything of that nature, then you can seek damages um, from that person having stole your trade secrets. But if somebody independently derives the information, so if they are able to reverse engineer your software, reverse engineer your manufacturing methods, then um, they basically can have that information. And so it's really important to take many, many different precautions to keep the information secret, but also select those processes, those competitive advantages that are not easily reverse engineered. So the, the, the balance is that always that, right? Can somebody very easily independently derive this? And if they can't, then it might be a good trade secret um, option. So this is generally protected under state law. There is a federal law that was signed into, um, a federal law that came into being during the Obama administration. However, currently it is still pretty ununiform from state to state. Different states have enacted different rules and laws around trade secrets. And so it's still largely a state issue, um, but hopefully that will kind of coalesce more and more over time. Um, it does require the enterprise to keep the information secret. So, and I have a whole list of different items on the next few slides here, but you do have to try to keep the information secret. And then obviously protection lasts indefinitely as long as you can keep it secret. And so here are some general practice pieces around keeping trade secrets secret. So you should require confidentiality agreements with anybody that may at minimum be coming into contact with that trade secreted information. I think confidentiality agreements in general are good, especially with employees and contractors that you're working with, but same with distributors and manufacturers and um, those different kinds of relationships, confidentiality agreements are key. Also conduct ongoing employee training. So not only you know, do employees need to know what their general job is, of course, with you, but also what it means for something to be confidential, what it means for something to be trade secret, what are best practices in the business to keep information secret or at least secure. Uh, and so I think you know, having some regular interval of training, uh, because if you don't have some kind of regular interval, it's just easy for certain employees to be left behind. You can also control access to information. Not everyone needs the same information. So for example, if you have somebody who's not touching manufacturing, then they probably don't need to know your manufacturing methods. Or maybe not every person who's involved in manufacturing needs to know all the steps of the manufacturing process. Maybe they only need to know their little niche piece. You could also restrict downloading of company information. So again, do all the files in your database or in your server need to be accessed by everybody? Or could you have certain permissions set up? Um, make sure you include confidential designations and you could even use embedded codes to trace copies of what's being copied in and where did it go. Um, so when employees you know, are working with you or when they're leaving, you can also retain the right to wipe drives or external devices, especially if you purchased those devices for your employees. You can prohibit the use of personal accounts, making sure that they all have work accounts and that there's strict guidelines around what goes in and out of those work accounts using passcodes, two-factor authentication, you know, any kind of information so you can verify that it's truly the employee that's accessing the information that they have the right to access. Um, have good company policy around cloud and external storage methods. You know, what is your preferred method? Do you not allow there to be you know, external device or storage method uses? Um, and also perform exit interviews. So not only do you not want your employee, if they are leaving, to take trade secreted information with them to their next employer, but you also don't want new employees bringing in trade secreted information from a previous employer. So you really want to keep yours and not have anybody else's, right? 
And so having that knowledge and sharing that knowledge with coming in employees and exiting employees is really important because you want to you know, keep your nose clean, just like you want your employee to keep your information secure. Um, so those are just some key practices, but honestly, you know, if you are a company that has trade secrets, you definitely want to establish a set of guidelines, protocols for all these different things so that you make sure that everybody who's touching those knows what to do and when. So that's a little bit about trade secrets. Um, the next I would like to talk about is patents. So what is protectable by patents? And it's really any process machine manufacture or composition of matter. So like a chemical, for example. And the protection lasts for 14 to 20 years, depending on the filing date. Most times it's actually 15 to 20 years now, 15 years being a design patent and 20 years being a plant or utility. And it gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, sale or selling the invention in the United States or importing the invention into the United States. And this would be similar for each country. For every country that you get a patent in, it gives you the right to exclude others via certain parameters in that country. So there are three different types of patents. I wanted to touch on all three of them because I do think Traverse City has a very diverse ecosystem. And so you definitely have um, you know, a rise in cannabis and hemp, but you also have a lot of people who are doing lots of cool innovative designs. And then some people who are in the tech uh, industry. And so that would be your utility patents. And so I'll briefly touch on each of these. Uh, so a plant patent lasts for 20 years. You can basically protect a plant that's defined by a set of characteristics. And so the really the claim of the patent is the Latin name. So the genus and the species of the plant. It cannot be a tuber or bacteria, but it could be an algae or a fungus. It could be a hemp. It could be a new cannabis species. Um, but the key here with plants, especially in the hemp and cannabis space, you are very likely going to have a lot, have to have a lot of data to back up the fact that it's a new species of cannabis or hemp. So it's probably not going to suffice just to send it in just with the images of the plant and different features of the plant. You are likely going to have to have some kind of biochemical data showing the terpene profile is different or um, something like that, because there's so much different species out there. We want to be able to differentiate. There's also some international um, protection opportunities. And then there's also some alternatives through the USDA um, if the plant, if a plant patent through the USPTO is not of interest. So for design patents, this protects the ornamental appearance of an article. So not the actual function or the article itself. So you, you could imagine even protecting the design of a fabric that is on a chair. You're not protecting the chair itself, but you're protecting the design of a fabric that is potentially used on a chair. You can also protect a table design. For example, you can see one there and even graphical user interfaces, as you can see here, I think it's the Facebook patent that I took that from. Um, so the unique thing about design patents is that you're actually claiming essentially the images, the solid lines are what you are protecting and the dashed lines are kind of for context and background information. So you're really protecting the you know, surface orientation, the configuration, overall visual impression. So there is also international opportunities through the Hague Agreement. And then utility patent basics, so protects the way an article of manufacture is used. But now we are a first inventor to file country. So that means that you need to be the first one to file. So that means if A invents today, B invents tomorrow, but B rushes to the patent office, B wins because he filed first, even though A invented first. So file early and often, but make sure it's ready for patenting. Don't, you know, don't do it too early. Um, so different types of utility patents. There's a provisional. It's basically your stake in the sand lasts for one year. Non-provisional, which is your utility patent, um, which every country in the world has, most countries in the world have utility patent option which is again, the, the function of a device and then international and foreign opportunities. So here's a quick table to kind of show you the, the pendency differences and the different examination differences. Provisional patent, it's not examined, just sits on a shelf for one year and then you can convert it to a non-provisional or international patent. The non-provisional, it basically pens until it's either issued into an actual patent or abandoned and it is examined. An international patent is sort of examined an international searching authority gives an opinion, but that's not binding on any country. And it basically expires once you take it into national phase or if you abandon it. And then lastly, a foreign patent, yes, they're examined and then they're issued and every country has their own 
uh, pendency for issue, issued pens. So I want to touch briefly on this and then we'll get over to uh, John. Um, so I wanna make sure people understand the difference between patent protected versus freedom to operate. So patentability allows you to exclude others and that's your mechanism of getting a patent. Whereas freedom to operate, make sure that you are not infringing on somebody else's patent. So making sure that you're not excluded from making or using or selling your device. And so think of it briefly this way, you had um, Edison's light bulb, clear glass light bulb, that was his invention. Pipkin came along and patented the frosted glass light bulb. For Pipkin to practice his invention, he had to infringe Edison's patent. And so the only way to remedy this is that Pipkin had to either license Edison's patent from, uh, for, uh, license Edison, Edison's patent, or Pipkin had to give a royalty of some sort back to, and there's lots of different shapes of this that it can take, and Jamie will speak to that, but and then you know, he basically sent a royalty back to Edison for use of his patent. And so that's some ways to get around freedom to operate issues, but it's definitely something that you want to consider early on in the process. So just a brief sum summary, uh, trade secrets can be extremely valuable, but again, you have to keep them secret and they cannot be independently derivable or at least very hard to. Design patents are often underutilized, but can be a huge benefit for products and software, especially now in the, the software world. And then utility patents are valuable, but they are expensive. So really weigh the pros and cons of getting utility patent if it's the right uh, move for your company. And then start the freedom to operate analysis early because you just it helps you know the landscape and make sure that you're not going to be blocked later on. So with that, I will exit mine and stop my share so that John can jump in here. Thanks, Ashley. So good afternoon, everyone. Let me press play. I'm going to talk today about trademark and copyright law, and this is just kind of a basic primer and I've tried to use local examples for everything that I'm discussing today. Copyright protection really is protection for creative works of authorship. And what does that mean? It basically means that uh, copyright protects creation. So it create it protects works that are what we call fixed in a tangible medium of expression, which is really just a fancy way of saying as soon as you write it down as soon as it's on a hard drive, you have copyright protection. So in the example that I've displayed here, this is a painting by uh, Derek DeYoung, who's a painter on Neatwana Point. Uh, as soon as he put his brush to canvas, he, he obtained copyright rights in that work. And what are the rights that you get? Well, these are kind of intuitive, but at the same time, the language is very specific. So you get six exclusive rights. You get the right to reproduce, so others can't reproduce that work. You have the right to prepare derivative works, which means that uh, somebody can't change aspects of that work and claim it as their own. You have the right to distribute copies. So if you want to sell prints of your work, uh, you have the right to do that. You have the right to publicly perform and display. And if it's an audio work, you have the, the right to control the transmission by means of digital audio transmission. So you can't stream it without authorization. Now let's break down these elements. Copyright does not protect certain items. It is only it is only extended, copyright protection is only extended to creative work. So they don't protect facts. Facts are really uh, not protectable by any form of intellectual property because they're facts about the world. Copyright does not protect ideas. That is the realm of patent as actually Ashley was discussing uh, earlier. Same with functional products, though you'll see in a minute that there are some exceptions there. And you have to have a work that's minimally creative. It has to possess a what we call a creative spark. And that threshold is really, really low. A line drawing on a piece of paper that my daughter, four-year-old daughter does is protectable by copyright. So the standard is not high. Uh, not that she's a terrible artist, but you kind of get the point. Um, in order to get copyright registration or in order to get copyright protection, the work has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression, as I mentioned before. And that just means that you write it down, it's on a hard drive or it's on a canvas. Now there are, within the realm of copyright, there are functional items that themselves could be eligible for copyright protection. The image uh, on the screen currently is a, what we call a fire bowl. Uh, most people would call it a fire pit. This is a design that's made by a client of ours, John Unger, who previously, he's an artist, was previously located in Antrim County. 
He has since moved to the Hudson Valley area of uh, upstate New York. And it has this really unique design and it's really cool. I've got one at my house. Now this work is functional in the sense that it allows for fire to heat a room. Uh, it can be outside, it can be inside. Some cases you can stick propane into it. Uh, but at the same time, it has these really cool design elements. And those design elements are protectable under copyright law, but they have to be either physically separable or conceptually separable. So in some cases, if the design element can be removed entirely physically, then that design element will be protectable if it's removable from the functional item. In this case, that's not possible, but here we have something that's conceptually separable. And the reason for that is you can imagine a world where that fire bowl doesn't need those designs on it. It could be a simple circle and the fire would still function within that circle. So again, useful articles are copyrightable, uh, but there are some very specific uh, requirements that are needed for that purpose. And you know, this, this particular design is also uh, subject to, I believe, a design patent. And we have another item that uh, Mr. Unger created that was covered by a utility patent that uh, Ashley talked about earlier. So there are definitely overlaps in the area of, of law that applies to these types of objects. Now, copyright registration is kind of uh, why copyright is so valuable to artists. And copyright registration must be done within three months of publication or prior to infringement. And the benefits are huge. You can obtain up to 150,000 in statutory damages per work infringed. You put the, uh, you have the ability to put others on notice of your rights. And then you have the ability to file a federal lawsuit for copyright infringement. Now, this is highly important because if you don't have a ton of, let's say you're an artist and you don't have a ton of money, if you can get up to 150,000 per work infringed in an in a infringement lawsuit and you want to enforce your rights and you don't have the money to pay an attorney, you can come to somebody like me, I can assess the claim, I can say, well, we could make money off of this, off of this, you could make money off of it, and we could also enforce your rights. And there's a huge incentive for somebody like me to take your case. So copyright registration is highly valuable. And a lot of our artists cl clients rely on that relationship because they typically cannot afford to pay an IP attorney. So having the ability to obtain these types of damages is highly valuable to them because it creates an incentive for them to enforce their work through an attorney where otherwise they would not be able to do so. And there's also international protection, which I won't go over deeply here, but basically this Berne Convention, which is signed by almost every major nation in the world says that works in one country must be given the same level of protection in other countries. So a lot of clients will come to us and they'll say, well, I'm getting ripped off in China or I'm getting ripped off in Germany. What can you do about it? Well, because of the Berne Convention, there are options and you can enforce your rights within other jurisdictions. And again, why copyright protection? Well, this is the perfect example. These mugs are licensed works uh, by Derek DeYoung, again, guy out on the Atuana Point who does fly fishing art. Uh, these are mugs that are designed by him and licensed uh, to a manufacturer for production. And you can have control over that licensing of works uh, to ensure that you have increased revenue streams. You don't just have to sell paintings. You don't just have to sell photographs. You can actually license those works to third parties to increase your revenue stream to make sure that you uh, have more money. And you can protect against things like copies of those works. Also, there's a, a little interesting piece of law called the uh, Visual Artist Rights Act, which if you're a public artist, you also have certain level of control over the way in which your art is displayed publicly, which is very powerful. Now, trademark protection protects a brand. Uh, great example is Prince's symbol. This is his application, or excuse me, his trademark registration that was filed with the USPTO. And trademarks are names, designs, and sometimes even colors or smells or sounds that indicate the origin or source of goods or services. For sounds, if you can imagine the THX sound, I, I just know it because we have a theater in our house. And um, it, as soon as you hear that sound, you know that it's probably going to be a Star Wars movie or some other movie made by Lucas because THX has that very distinctive ear shattering sound that comes on before a movie. So almost anything can act as a trademark as long as it indicates the origin or source of those goods or services. Now these rights are created through use in commerce. The first to use a trademark gets rights to it. 
as long as it's used in association with the sale or offering for sale of some goods or services, it has to be within uh, within commerce. It can't just be used uh, to reserve a right. Now, trademarks are on a spectrum. And when I say a spectrum, I mean, if you think of a, a number line almost, uh, at one end, there are words that are not protectable. And on the other end, there are words that are highly protectable. And I'm gonna walk through that. And I kind of use this graphic here that looks like a fuel meter with, you know, at one end, items that are not protectable because they're effectively generic. And on the other end, there are things that are highly protectable because they are made up. Now, generic terms are words like table, computer, law firm. These are things that can't be registered as trademarks because we don't want to remove them from the use of ordinary English language use. We don't want somebody to own table, own computer, or own law firm. So we don't allow those to be registered. Descriptive terms are terms that describe a quality or a characteristic or a geographic location of the goods or services that are sold underneath them. So here I use the example of chunky cheese, because if you think of chunky cheese for salad dressing, you kind of think, oh yeah, that makes complete sense. It's chunky cheese, it goes on salad, sure. Uh, great example locally, Cherry Capital Foods is a descriptive term. They are located in the Cherry Capital. They deliver food to restaurants and other locations. It's a descriptive term. And these terms are eligible for trademark registration after they've acquired what's called secondary meaning. That just means that when we talk about them, uh, if I mention Cherry Capital Foods, you know that that points to a specific business. When that association has been made, then a descriptive term can be registered and, you, and uh, protected as a trademark. Now, if you use a trademark or use a word in a descriptive sense as a trademark uh, for a period of five years or more, it is presumed that it has acquired secondary meaning. So those descriptive terms can be registered ultimately. Suggestive terms are seen as kind of inherently distinctive, but uh, they require a little bit more of a mental leap than a descriptive term. And that's a really terrible way to say that we don't really know what suggestive means, but it's kind of where lawyers make money because it's, uh, it, it's like a descriptive term. So it kind of describes the goods or services being offered but it doesn't quite do it because your mind has to make an additional leap. And the best example that I can give is Microsoft because Microsoft is the combination of microcomputer and software. And sure, if you look at it for a while, you'll parse out those descriptive terms and say, of course, that's what it means. But very clearly, it's not directly uh, apparent to you that that's what's being said when you review that term. But it points directly to a business and it's registrable as a trademark. Arbitrary terms are really good trademarks. These are words that are considered to be very strong because they are ordinary language uh, words that are used in a different context. So great examples are Apple for computers, or, you know, not for apples, obviously for computers, and then Amazon for books. Both of these are ordinary language terms that are used outside of their ordinary context uh, for different purposes. And because of that, we see them as very strong trademarks that are protectable. And then finally, our fanciful terms are those terms that are entirely made up, things like Kodak or Pepsi. These are words that uh, they're just made up. So they're seen as highly distinctive and can be registered. Now, when you're looking at actually picking a brand name, it's tough because you start a business you can't just really make up a word because when you first start trying to sell it to people, it's difficult for them to understand what it is that you're exactly selling. If I was selling legal services and I called myself Dodge, no one would have any idea what I was talking about when I tried to advertise that to somebody. It's only after that uh, longstanding uh, use in commerce where these fanciful terms or these arbitrary terms really get their power because they kind of reduce search costs. So if you're a consumer and you want to go reach for that, uh, reach for that next drink, you know that Pepsi, you're going to be able, able to easily grab Pepsi instead of brown cola, which might be sitting next to Pepsi on the shelf because it has that very distinctive name. Now, trademark registration has benefits just like copyright, where you put others on notice of your rights, you own the mark in the United States, 
and you can obtain up to $2 million in statutory damages for the use of your trademark in association with counterfeits. You can stop importation of infringing products. Uh, you can defend against claims of infringement yourself. And these are all very valuable. Again, the, the real practical reason is that attorneys can take cases on a contingency basis because they can make money and you can make money. So the incentives line up if you seek trademark registration early. So I have four takeaways uh, from this talk. I know this is kind of fast and I'm speaking quickly, but if you plan to commercialize a work of art, copyright protection should be considered immediately. If you plan to build out and invest in a brand for your business, you should get a trademark clearance and uh, get that done before you start investing heavily in your brand. A key example of this is um, uh, Beaners and Big B Coffee. Be Big B Coffee had to change, or excuse me, Beaners changed to Big B Coffee. And if you look back to the, the um, news coverage, it was a highly expensive process, particularly because they hadn't thought very clearly about their future expansion plans. And, and those types of changes midstream can be a devastating process for a business. It's difficult to transfer consumer goodwill into a, a new mark if there's an infringement concern or if you didn't perform a trademark clearance at the outset. And then again, trademark registration is important because it protects your rights. But just like copyright registration, it protects you against claims of infringement. And it also gives your attorney an incentive to, to take your case and, and try to defend against infringement of your works and your brand. So thank you for the time. And that's all I have. OK, thanks, John. We'll uh, come to the last part here. So now we're uh, going to cover on this section the um, the part of it. How do you make money from this protection that you created around your creative works? And I'll cover a little bit on a definition, what some of the options are, uh, get into an overview of the licensing and some points to consider, and end with some examples. So first, um, very high level, the definition is the process of turning a non-revenue generating creative work into cash. In other words you're commercializing your intellectual property. Um, in monetization, one of the important things to think about is it can also be more than just making money. It can refer to other benefits you get from, uh, from this process. So for example, one of the things that you may want out of your um, efforts here is to get more awareness and utilization of your creative work, maybe not just for cash, but just for awareness. It can also create partnerships and relationships that are derived from the value that you have. So you can enter into different kinds of um, business relationships that you might not otherwise be able to do. Now, in terms of the options, very simply, um, one option is you can sell your intellectual property. You get a one-time financial gain and you transfer complete ownership of it to another party. But in this case, you've now lost control of your property. So the the opportunity is around licensing, which is really a form of renting your intellectual property. And that's really where we're gonna focus the time on this section. So at a, uh, a high level, um, what is a license? A license is a legal agreement, which defines the terms under which one party may use the property, which is derived from the creative work owned by another party. Um, and it's the vehicle, obviously, now as we talked about, to monetize or commercialize what you created or own. And you can use this for all forms of property. Licensing is used in, in all forms, such as real estate, but typically it's gonna be all the areas of intellectual property that uh, Ashley and John just talked about, whether it's patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, um, all of those can be licensed. And one important term, and I'll be using that more um, as this goes on, is that if you're the IP owner, the intellectual property owner, you're the licensor, and the other party who is renting your intellectual property is the licensee. So there are a lot of advantages uh, for uh, doing the licensing. And I think first and foremost, and, and, and this was covered a bit by earlier, is that you keep control. So you determine for how long the other party can use the property and you can also incorporate quality control because if the objectives that you set are not being met, you can terminate you can just stop it and then you, you've you owned it, but, but the use of it can be stopped. Um, splitting of the markets. This is a really important element of licensing, which um, uh, creates, I think, tremendous value in that you can license 
different parts of your intellectual property or your intellectual property into different areas. So it can either be by geography. Uh, for example, you can license to different states within the US or you can license it to different countries. Um, so if you have a, a, a technology or an artwork or something that you wanna work with um, a, a company that's outside the United States and they would represent you, they could be licensed only for that region. Um, but it can also be in different market areas. And this is called fields of use. Um, that's a term that you'll see in these agreements of fields of use. Um, one example might be um, if you've got a product that is in, um, has to do with uh, medical um, activities. It might be one that is used in the human health arena, but it could also be used in the veterinary market. Those are two different markets and your licenses could be different to those. It could also be between um, school markets uh, schools and universities, and the other could be in retail or consumer. So different ways to split up your market. Another advantage is that you get to make your money over time. And this is important because in some cases, whoever is gonna be licensing your technology or your IP might have to do their own investment of, of cash upfront to generate sales, but then they share their success with you through this license, through this royalty you'll get. And I'll talk about royalty in a minute. But that, that income stream that you get as the licensor can potentially continue over the whole lifetime of the IP protection. And as you heard, that varies depending on, it could be uh, forever if you maintain your copyrights and trademarks, or it can be through the lifetime of a patent, for example. And there are other options in a license agreement where you can build in benefits uh, for yourself. And this may get into things which are more strategic for you versus financial. Uh, that might be, for example, a right of first negotiation to buy whatever the licensee has developed using your creative work, your technology, which you might not be doing on your own. So here are some terms that you'll see in license agreements. And again, very high level, there's a, there's a lot more than these, but these are important. So the first one is, what is the grant of a license? What rights are you giving to this licensee? And this gets into the ability of that to be split because it, it may not just be a right to sell, it may also be a right to make it or a right to have it made. And that might be important if you wanna license um, a manufacturer for your technology, but you intend on continuing to sell it, but they may license there. <clears throat> and then you can also, as I said before, determine which um, uh, the uses of that, of that IP and, and how it's gonna be used and for what market segments. And, the interesting thing about this then is you can license multiple parties for your intellectual property without diminishing the value of the underlying IP. It doesn't make it any less valuable when you split it up this way. And royalties uh, is a term that's used for the money you make as a percentage of the licensee's business. And Ashley mentioned this earlier. And that's sometimes referred to as a royalty rate, which can be a percentage of their sales, but it can also be based on other measures. You can get a, uh, a royalty rate for each unit sold as opposed to based on the, the the price or it could also be on units made if it's a technology or something that's in the manufacturing process. And that gives you flexibility to set up the agreement for the best way for you to be compensated for your intellectual property. Exclusivity is uh, an important term. You know, is the, does the licensee have an exclusive right to use intellectual property, which means they're the only one who can use it even to your own exclusion or is it non-exclusive meaning that it can be used by multiple parties. And there might be a, a situation where you want to license your IP across a whole bunch of different uh, companies, uh, suppliers or whomever that compete with each other, but it helps you establish a standard because maybe that's the thing that everybody needs to use. Term, how long does this license last? And you can set this in different ways. It can be for a set time with um, opportunities to renew it if, if you're both parties are um, agreeable with the performance, or it could potentially continue for the life of the intellectual property. We talked about the term uh, or the life of IP earlier. Then quality control or other requirements. This gets into, um, especially with trademarks, do you control the quality of the product or the service that's being delivered using your intellectual property, such as a trademark? Or do you, in some cases with say patent, do you wanna control how much uh, the sales are at a minimum by that uh, licensee for them to be able to keep the license? So when we think about these agreements, just a few points to consider when you start 
considering to be setting up license agreements. And again, um, I'm not an attorney, so you will need to work with attorneys when you, when you do these license agreements. But uh, one of the things to think about is incentives. What are the reasons that your licensee will be successful? Do you want to have what's called a carrot or a stick approach? Is it more about um, benefits for the licensee or penalties if they don't get certain things? Um, again, what options do you have if certain performance or quality requirements aren't met? You know, you may want to have an incentive that maybe the royalty rate goes down if they hit sales at higher levels. That gives you, they, that means there's incentive for them to grow the business and they're not constantly paying higher and higher royalties. It starts to go down, uh, but then you still make money. Um, can you have the term of the, of the license set up based on meeting milestones? Or in some cases, do you need to threaten or sue if, if the other party isn't taking a license, if they're infringing your IP, for example? A change in control is important to consider um, if your licensee is being acquired or bought out, because what if they're, the, the company that acquires them isn't doing the same amount of effort to sell your, your intellectual property protected creative work? Um, and there's some things where you may actually want to request a payment if certain companies are acquiring your licensee, and that's a way for you to get some of a return if you think they're not going to do the same effort in the future. Uh, this last point is important is the ongoing interaction with a licensee. I think uh, <clears throat> unlike a sale, we talked about earlier, your option is to sell the IP, but if you are entering a license agreement, it's really an ongoing relationship. And if you have a, 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 an IP that you're um, licensing that maybe is very important to that company and you want to stay in touch with them, you may want a board seat on that licensee if it's a pretty important one to them, or you may have regular review of their sales performance. And you may even hold meetings um, with the licensees to help them succeed using your intellectual property. So I'm going to finish by um, talking about three Northern Michigan examples of, of licensing. Uh, the first one is going to cover a company in the top rock that makes retaining walls. Um, Promethean and their brand Thermovance is a heating and cooling system technology in Traverse City. And then M22, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, uh, the lifestyle brand Arrow, which is also in Traverse City. So Ready Rock um, has a technology for making retaining walls. And part of this has to do with, you know, the, they, they pour concrete or they have rocks in different forms they make. And the, the potential for shipping that to different distances is not really realistic because of shipping costs and it's just not a good business model. So what they've come up with is a licensing approach. And they protect the know-how and the technology around how they make these forms through a pretty broad platform of patents. They have 34 active patents. They have trademarks. They even have copywritten marketing materials. And then that ends up being licensed to these other companies, precasters, ready mix companies, or contractors. And they've been doing this for 20 years. And what this allows the licensee to do uh, is to have their business locally with their own materials, but they're using the intellectual property that Ready Rock had protected, uh, and that's the, the source of income to Ready Rock. And as I mentioned before, there's a benefit to potentially keeping your licensees um, informed of, of, of each other's activities, and that's what Ready Rock has done. They have a network of 130 manufacturers who have uh, centuries of combined experience with Ready Rock, and they help them share their experiences, that actually helps them bind closer to the, the company, to Ready Rock, but also they get a, benef a benefit from that in getting better performance out of the, uh, the technology. The second example here is um, a, more of a technology, direct technology. In this case, um, it was invented in Traverse City. They have a number of pending patents, so you can see in the center. And it's a, a platform technology. It's useful in a variety of different settings. I won't go into the details of it, but it allows for both heating and cooling and they already have a deal with um, a motorcycle seat, which is the, the color image at the bottom, but they're looking as well to license to other industries such as aviation, uh, office market, as well as the military. And again, example where you split up the markets, you can get more value for your intellectual property in a licensing situation. And then lastly, uh, with M22, um, well-known trademark, and, and John has uh, many stories because he was involved with uh, defending that in litigation um, to protect that, that registered trademark. But the company uh, has been very successful uh, in, on the apparel side, but they've also applied it to um, lifestyle guides and in licensing, in this case with Crystal River Outfitters, 
have licensed the brand so that it is uh, offered um, by some of their uh, facilities. And it's also including things like um, wines, where you see the M22 uh, trademark on wines, as well as on the sides of the Crystal River canoes, you see the M22 logo. So another example where licensing uh, has increased the value for that company. So with that, um, I think we uh, will have time here for more questions um, and we uh, can go to the chat, I guess, or the Q and A and Neil. And, uh, let me see. I think the first one's for John there. So I'll read the question out loud. It says, uh, how much is how much is a copyright registration or is it free to do? A copyright registration is not free. There is, I believe, a $60 filing fee per work. Um, you can file via eco.copyright.gov. If you, and it's pretty easy to do. It's a, it's kind of a workflow, software workflow that you can do yourself. If you suspect that you're going to be in litigation, I typically tell clients to hire an attorney to do it. If you don't believe that you will be, it probably doesn't matter. But uh, if you are a plaintiff in a copyright infringement lawsuit, the first thing that somebody like me on the other side is going to do is pull the, the filing record to see if there's anything in there that will invalidate the registration, because that will cut off your ability to maintain a copyright infringement claim. So it's something to think about when filing, but certainly you can do it yourself. It's cheap, it's easy, uh, but it is not free. Awesome, thanks, John. And then um, question here for me, I'll read the question as well. How is it legal for food and beverage companies to keep their ingredients a secret? For example, Coca-Cola formula. Surely it has to pass through FDA regulation and potential allergies made public. And that's a great question. So um, as you know, the Freedom of Information Act does allow any person to access federal agency records and view information. However, so that would include things in the FDA submission. But if you are submitting to the FDA, you can mark certain aspects of your application as trade secreted or confidential, but this can still be kind of difficult because if those features are required for FDA approval, now you kind of have a conflict between what you want to protect and remain secret versus what's needed. So for example, from a biologic perspective, you know, it's probably gonna be pretty well known um, from your patents and filings that, you know, maybe some active moiety has been um, disrupted, but the, uh, the way you formulate it potentially or different characteristics of it, you still might be able to keep that secret since it's maybe not critical for FDA approval. So that's a great question. It does pose kind of a, a balance of, of those two worlds and really making sure that you clearly try to define those things that are not required for FDA approval, but still marking them as secret so that you can you know, keep those out of the public record. And then I think Camille has a question for you, John. Uh, Camille asks, can you trademark a geographical place name? I'm thinking specifically about us branding the Grand Traverse region as Creative Coast. How does New York City have the brand I Heart New York? So the, the yes, the short answer is yes, you can trademark a geographical place name as long as it is used in association with goods and services that originate from that geographical location. Um, this, this is a very complex question. So I'm gonna to try to answer it in a really easy way. Think about champagne. So there are, there are um, types of marks that indicate the origin or the region of certain goods or services. There are geographical marks that are used in association with goods and services that uh, are not descriptive. So I could use New York for uh, sunglasses. I could use, um, you know, M22 for t-shirts. Uh, which has arguably been considered a geographical location as well. So there are ways to do it. How does New York City have the brand I Heart New York? Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at that trademark, but I would suspect that it's what we call a design plus words mark. Uh, design plus words marks can get registration because they have a distinctive design. So in that case, it's probably the I Heart New York logo. Uh, even though the underlying terms are generic, uh, which I would probably argue I Heart New York is. So I don't know that specific example, but there's probably a justifiable, smart reason why they've done it the way that they have. And John, I actually have a question for you too. How, how, what are common ways that artists find infringing copyrights or infringing, infringing works? Is it because they like encounter it randomly, you know, while they're marketing their product? Are they actually using different tools to search for it? 
Yeah, so there's a couple of ways. Uh, one is random, just brought to their attention by some third party or by themselves if they're doing a search. The second, uh, more, more established brands uh, example is Nintendo. I had a call with Nintendo's attorneys this week defending a client case. Uh, Nintendo uses sophisticated image recognition technology that has a combination of um, image characteristics associated with their intellectual property, so their specific characters of Mario, Luigi, et cetera, combined with keyword searches. So they run scripts and they have software that does that. Um, and then there are watermarking tools that people will use. Um, there's a number of providers out there that will allow you to watermark an image in a way that allows you to crawl, for example, the web and find infringing uses based on that watermark. Um, problem is sometimes people cut those watermarks out or they destroy the metadata associated with the watermark. Uh, but it's all difficult uh, at the higher levels. So typically the way that smaller clients are gonna find it is just random luck and by their own searches. I see we have another question, which is probably best for um, John, you and, and Ashley, but I, I just had a question related to this is it says if, it, if you design a custom table intended to be a one of a, kind, one of a kind product, what would be the best way to protect that? And I guess in some cases you get into um, cost benefit of, of different approaches, because I imagine actually this could be a design patent, but if it's a one of, one of a kind that may not be the best way, but, but John, what are other ways that if it is a one of a kind product, does that fall under a copyright or not? Yeah, you could, if there's a design element that is either physically or conceptually separable from the physical product of the table, you could file for copyright registration. You could protect it as a brand. So um, great example of a brand uh, that is having trouble, but has loyalty is um, Hyper Ice or the Theragun. I don't know if you've ever seen these devices, but they're mm -hmm. vibrating percussion devices used for muscle massage. And um, they're having trouble with knockoffs. The way that they're dealing with it is just by having strong brand presence and telling people to look for that brand because it's reliable and it's it's the the brand for that purpose. So that yeah, cost benefit analysis is definitely um, a part of the equation, particularly because patents typically are expensive. But Ashley can talk about that. I think patent would probably be the best way if it is eligible for patent protection. Yeah, I mean, I think a design patent is probably the clearest opportunity, but it just depends on how much that design gives um, a certain um, visual distinctiveness. It's not a simple, you know, is it, is it completely different from what's currently out there? It's kind of like the overall visual impression it gives, like an airiness or a rigid feel or, so it's kind of an assessment of what's, what's the impression that a person gets when viewing the product. And so, and you know, in terms of looking at it versus what's been previously out there. But if it's also, it depends on how it's one of a kind. If it's one of a kind in like, in the, in the sense that it is a hyper expandable table with, you know, interesting ways that leaves are inserted or hidden or, you know, then that could be a utility patent, right? Cause it's a, a the usefulness, right? It's how that table is actually constructed and it's utility. But if it's solely the visual impression, right? That it has unique, um, floating elements or you know things like that then I would say a design patent but I think any for sure it's a it's a business decision a lot of times with these ones that are, have multiple avenues and kind of what what's your use case how would you enforce certain types of intellectual property is it solely brand recognition is it because you want to enforce it you know so I think you have many options in that case and so it's just a business decision around cost and advantages and and things like that. And somebody else has another one too. We create many unique designs images every year. As a small company, it's not cost effective for us to protect everything we create. Do you have an advice? We have been infringed many times, mostly companies from China or Amazon or China and Amazon. Um, are these, so this is, I assume like works of art. Is that, I don't know if the attendee can elaborate on that you say designs and images i'm assuming kind of like copyrighted material so i don't know if you can speak to that john you know what's a cost effective way to deal with that yeah so with amazon what we have done is if you can register your most um sole and valuable works then we can typically file what's called an ex parte temporary restraining order to seize the payment accounts of a 
uh, seller in China who's knocking off your works. We just did that recently in the Northern District of Illinois in federal court. And what we do is we, we figure out if they're using PayPal, for example, file what, what's called an ex parte temporary restraining order, seize the account, determine how much, is ca how much cash is in there. Typically there's quite a bit. And then we make them come to the table because we're holding their cash. And so once we're holding their cash, they have to come to the US and actually answer the complaint, whereas otherwise you're not gonna be in a position to force them to have that conversation. In China, copyright has a bit more power than, um, than it does in the US as well. So there's the ability to stop the exportation uh, or the importation of infringing products. Um, we have a great Chinese firm that we work with. Uh, we can connect you with them if you want to look into that. And then with Amazon, uh, Amazon's kind of a wild west. Typically, there's not going to be any claims against Amazon. Um, if you're talking about a patentable work, though, Ashley can talk more about this, but Amazon does have this kind of neutral patent evaluation program where you can uh, use your patent to attack infringing uses on the platform. And it's kind of useful, it's new. I, I haven't used it. I don't know anyone that has used it, but that might also be another option. Yeah, you're right. I've actually heard of that program as well and don't know of any use cases so far of it and the success rate of it. Um, but I think, you know, from just like a cost perspective, I think you have to weigh which are gonna be the most valuable or the most, you know, made like by market fit or, um, client interest, you know, trying to weigh the, you know, of what's going to be the most valuable versus like what's maybe a little bit lower tiered. I know we have a lot of clients that we have to kind of go through that balance of what's going to be the most, you know, marketable, the most promising, the most, and then everything under that maybe gets like, you know, a lesser priority in terms of protection, whatever it may be. I had a question for John. I think you sort of touched on this before, but um, the term trade dress which I think has been used for say the shape of a Coke bottle. Um, is that just a subset of trademark law or where, where does trade dress fall? Yeah, trade dress is a subset of trademark law and typically it requires secondary meaning like I discussed before. So the, the best example that I had in my presentation is that fireball again. Um, when we sought protection for that design, we also sought protection for the unique shape under trade dress law because our argument was that that fireball indicated the source of those goods, meaning that when somebody saw that type of design, they knew that it, it pointed directly to John Unger. So that it's just a number, number uh, excuse me, another level of protection, uh, like trademark, but it is open to product design categories, like you said, to the, the Coke bottle shape uh, or to other design elements. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really cool, piece of law because you can even have trade dress protection on, for example, the interior of a Mexican restaurant, where if you're a franchisor and all of your restaurants look the same, you can even obtain trade dress protection for that type of consistency within your brand. So it's something to, to look at, certainly. So is it more of like a tangible, because you know, I know that trademarks indicate the source of goods. So is it more of a tangible protection? You know, like, I mean, obviously a, a mark is tangible as well, but it's actually like a physical product related to a mark as opposed to just, you know, more abstract goods and services attached to a mark? It's, it's tough to say. So uh, typically I say it's look and feel. So ex for example, a website could have a certain um, color and design scheme that is indicative of all websites underneath a brand. And as long as there's consistency and they indicate the source of the goods or services, then that they can obtain protection. Um, same with the Coke bottle, like look and feel is the way that I think the easiest way to describe it. It can be intangible uh, in the sense of like a website or some other form of non-physical product, or it can be physical as well. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. It looks like we have one more question that came in through the chat function. Um, and this person is asking, if the infringement is a small amount owed on licensing infringement, is it worth going through small claims? I guess I'll, I'll answer that. Um, being default attorney, <laughs> uh, the answer is, uh, the right answer is no. The potential answer is maybe. Uh, 
the reason the right answer is no is because almost all intellectual property infringement is the purview of federal court. So you need a registration typically to get access to federal court and infringement claims therefore must be brought typically in federal court. There are some cases, state cases on trademark law, et cetera. Um, now, even if it's a federal claim, is a small claims court going to hear it practically? Maybe. If it's under $7,000 in Michigan, you might get lucky with a small claims court judge and they might not kick it based on jurisdiction and they might have a conversation with you about it and try to resolve it that way. So practically speaking, you can try it. Um, there's probably not a lot of downside because there's you know, for typically not a lot of risk in uh, small claims court, but the right answer is almost always federal court. Great, well, it looks like that's all the questions that have come through and we're right on time. Thank you so much um, to our panelists today. It's been such a pleasure to listen to you and to hear your insights. And I'd like to remind our audience that this webinar is one in a series of webinars to be held between now and the end of December. And next week, we have a very special guest joining us. We have a Broadway actress who's currently starring as Angelica Schuyler in Hamilton's first national tour. And she'll be helping you master your stage presence and your pitch presentation skills. And you can sign up for that one and see more webinars at traversconnect.com forward slash events. So thank you again, Jamie, John, and Ashley. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Camille. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.